Right, good afternoon everyone. We're quite lucky today that we've managed to get a hold of Ian Telford, uh, someone who we've been wanting to talk to uh, for a while and obviously things are a little bit more tricky to do that now when we have to do it remotely. But I saw Ian speak at an education law conference um, a few months back now and he really um, spoke so passionately about children and complex care and some of the things that um, teenagers and children are going through with family situations. And he does that on a daily basis as part of his uh, practice as a barrister. So we got a hold of him, we set this up, he's gave me his time, um, and we're really thankful for that. So Ian, um, it's great to have you with us and we're, we're really pleased that you're here and we know that some of the messages and stories you've got to share are gonna be really relevant. Uh, before we get into that, if it's okay with you, I'll just give you a bit of a, a formal introduction. Um, so Ian, is now a barrister uh, focusing specifically in family law, uh, complex care, child arrangements, uh, lawyer for child, domestic violence issues, and adoption as well. Um, so some really emotional um, cases that he deals with. Before that, um, Ian was a practicing lawyer in, he's been in small provincial firms, he's been in international firms, he's been in local government, um, as well as um, in a previous career, a registered nurse. Um, specialising particularly in psychiatry, psychiatric care, uh, senior manager in funding within the healthcare sector, and um, some work around drug and alcohol addiction. So a rich, um, a rich level of experience you bring in, and like I said, thank you for being here. So cool. it's great that we've got your time, and I don't know too many barristers, um, mm. but I, I get a sense that not many of them have been nurses before they were lawyers yeah. and barristers so it's quite a unique um set of circumstances you've you may have found yourself in i think um mm. can you give me a bit of insight into how that all came about you know going from school to nursing to now obviously working at a very top end of your profession in law um any insights into that please well in some ways it was all kind of by accident um, <laughs> as, as many things happen you know um I, I got interested in nursing because um, back, in, back in the day that, that I was in sixth form, there was a program called Casualty on TV in England, which you might know about, Andrew. I do a little bit, yeah. Uh, and I just thought that the, um, the nurses were, in particular, were, were these absolute heroes. And um, so I got this into my head that I was going to do nursing. And then when I got there, I realized that I couldn't really cope with blood and guts very well and um, then psychiatry became very attractive <laughs> I can imagine. So, so I ended up I ended up working in psychiatry working primarily with well in acute psychiatry but um, mainly with children in the end so children with um, particularly um, difficult um, behaviors and um, autism and that kind of stuff um, which I absolutely loved I loved nursing I loved the um, challenge of it um, I love the camaraderie of it, um, being in a team of people um, with a common common cause and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy the shift work. Um, all of my mates, you know, were, were, were working nine to five kind of jobs and I was working sort of 12 to 16 hours a day yeah, yeah. Um, when I was just a young guy. So um, uh, I ended up going out with someone who was a um, who was a barrister, and um, she said, "Look, um, why don't you give this a go?" Mm. Um, and we and I ended up doing a law degree. Right. Um, so I did my nurse training, and then I ended up doing a law degree. Um, and actually, at the time, I thought, "Look, I'd probably go into nurse management or something like that." Um, I didn't I didn't think that I would become a lawyer. Um, but I got towards the end of my law degree and I thought, look, why not? I'll give it a go. So I went to law school, finished off my vocational training and, um, and then, I was a, then I was a lawyer. And that was in the UK at the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and obviously there has been a bit of a common thread through all of that, which you've mentioned a few times as children. Um, yeah. I think you've, you've always had a, an affinity, you know, for complex situations involving children or has that evolved over time is it something that goes back to your school days where's that sort of leaning towards you know some of the more vulnerable yeah. part of our society where's that came from 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think, yes, I mean, all of my work has been with vulnerable people, you know, so yeah. um, primarily young people and children. Um, I, 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 I can't entirely answer that, but, 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 but that is the case. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's possibly, you know, it, it's something that you get becomes your sort of new norm. Mm. Um, so particularly in psychiatry, you know, you end up working with people who um, exhibit really bizarre behaviours. And, and I have to say there's something slightly addictive to that, you know, working with, um, with such peculiarity. Right. Um, and 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 it's and it's so interesting. Yeah. Um, and people often say, "How you know what's? How can you go from nursing to to the law?" Well, well, actually, my my role at the minute is very similar indeed to nursing. Okay. So nurses, you know, they get very complicated situations. Um, people who are in crisis, people who are very sick, or whatever it is, and it's their job to make sense of it. Yes. Um, and to make it better you know in, in a nutshell you know yes, yeah of course nurses, all if you know you meet any nurses they're incredibly good at solving problems yes um and and the law is very much like that the law is about you know this is the story this is the mess this is the problem um and and good lawyering is um taking people through that and giving them solutions and helping them fix it you know, if you build, if you boil it right down to its bare bones, that's the job. Yeah. Um, and and I think that you know when I when when I think about the training that I've done, I think I owe more to my nurse training than I do to my legal training. Right. Because you know, as a nurse, you learn how to go into a room, read a room, um, read the behaviour of people, uh, how people are interacting. Um, and how to um, work with the dynamic, yeah. you know. And I think if you can do that well as a as a as a lawyer, particularly in the field that I work in, um, then you can serve people an awful lot better. Yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just thinking that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of that cross referencing of skills across different yeah. sectors, and and probably there's not as many people who've gone through those different career some people have one career change maybe but you've two or three or four yes. um, what are some of the things that you think have given you the, the confidence or the ability to sort of change direction or um sort of pack one thing in and start a new one i mean there's, there's it takes a, a certain kind of person to do that is there any skills or habits or kind of character traits that you think are inherent in you that have made that possible? Yeah, um, I think that when I I was I couldn't believe that I was accepted onto law, um, and I thought, oh, even if I get in, I'll not be able to do it. But then when I got in, I found that I could, uh, um, and and then when you get your law degree, you think, well. Well, I've got my law degree, so I could, I could go to law school, which is what you do in England, or here you do profs, and and I can do the vocational. Why not? If I can do the academic part of the training, why can't I do the vocational part of the training? And I think you do build confidence as you um, continue, you know, on in your yes. um, in your studies or 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 your career. I've been fortunate to have people along the way who have encouraged me. You know, people who have who said go for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, w one thing that I've realised about myself, um, I remember going for a, a job once as senior counsel for a, a medical insurer, and they were very keen on me, obviously because I was a lawyer and I was a nurse, so yeah. it was perfect crossover. And um, they sent me off on a to do a psychometric test, and they said it was to um, to look at how I would fit in with the um, team. And I didn't give it a second thought, and I rocked up to this psychologist's office to do this um, psychometric test. And what I was confronted with was lots of shapes and mathematical things. Um, and I'm really bad, like real bad, at maths. <laughs> and, and, I, <laughs> yeah. and I kind of freaked out. And 
did this test and I got this really awkward call from the general counsel saying, um, we've got this really odd result. <laughs> um, it kind of places you below average intelligence. <laughs> and, you know, and that can't be the case because you've got several degrees and you know, you're a practicing lawyer and stuff. Um, and I kind of freaked out about that, but I, I spent some time with a psychologist. And what I really learned was, was that, um, for example, with mathematics, she said, you know, you are really slow, but highly accurate. Okay. Um, and, and we ended up having this discussion about the results. And, and she sort of, from the results, she actually read back to me my life. Right. Um, and, and, the, and the crux of it was, was that, you know, you're a really hard worker. Mm. You're not the brightest guy in town, but you work really hard. And, and, and that is, that is kind of how I am. Yeah. I, I went to law school with some incredibly clever people, like real clever people. You know, you, they would, they would read a, a set of facts and be able to summarize them. Yeah. Um, whereas I would read through read again, make some notes, and then I would get my head around it. And that's kind of how I operate. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I will always put the work in <laughs> to, to be able to do a competent or above competent job. Yeah. You know, and I, I would never settle for less. Yeah, and I, I'm so pleased you've mentioned that. We, we talk about that a lot at school, that um, the ability to, the, to work hard and how that can be mm. talent a lot of the time with, you know, work yeah. ethic and, and finding yeah. those things that you can really hang your hat on a little bit. And we, we, I'm so pleased you've mentioned that from someone who's gone on to be as successful as yourself, that hard work does pay yeah. off in the end. And yeah. for some of the boys, it probably feels like it's not going to because they're in the middle of something at the time, but it's great. Yeah. To, it's really refreshing to hear that. Sure. Um, and I suppose that brings me on to talking about your current role and your profession now. Mm. And I know it's hard to say a typical week or a typical day, but in terms of what you do, could you give an insight into what a passage of work would look like when you say, you know, I've really, I'm working hard, I'm doing this. What is it? Because it's such a fascinating thing that you do, um, especially with children and very complex cases. Yes. Can you give us any thoughts or feelings or insights into what a typical working week would be for you? Yeah, well, I mean, my, my work changes a lot, um, yeah. given a typical week. But, but in any week, I will be um, meeting with children. So we meet directly with children and we, we talk to them about what's happening to them and what they would like the court to understand. Yep. Um, the second part of my role when I act for children is to act as I see in their best interests. So I make a decision on how I will progress their case. Right. So children in this country literally get their own lawyer, which is yep. a, which is a prize. It's a, it's, it's, it's something that we, we need to cherish because there are lots of countries um, in the, in the world who don't have that. Most of them don't. Yep. So I meet directly with children. I meet with parents um, for children who are in care, I will meet with social workers. We have family group conferences where the families get together to talk about what, um, what plans need to happen to keep children safe. Um, most days I will appear in court. Um, and appearing in court is, is, a, is hugely varied as well. So there are list appearances where um, you appear before a judge and the aim of it really is to decide what needs to happen to move things on. Mm. There are short hearings, so for you know, half a day or even an hour, where you're before a judge trying to persuade a judge to do what you want, which is the crux of what, what yep. being a lawyer is. Um, sometimes we have long hearings, you know, so um, you know, we can have hearings that go from a day to goodness, you know, two or three weeks even. Um, so I'm involved in a case at the minute, which is very complex indeed. Um, there are over 15 clinicians wow. who need to be cross-examined and the parties and then the social workers. So, so that we're estimating that will take four or five weeks. Right. Um, but that's the very far end, end of, of the scale, if you like. So it can go from 15 minutes um, where you know 
an hour standing outside the court gossiping with your friends and then you've got five minutes before the judge and you're out right. to you know weeks weeks in front of a judge um and you know the 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 skills that are required for those those different um court appearances if you like are, are, are really different so um you know but but the common thread for for all all court work all work in fact as a lawyer is being prepared right you know and you know i teach on the um, vocational course for for wannabe lawyers and mm. You can you can see young lawyers sort of glaze the gl eyes glaze over thinking oh yeah 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 we've heard this before but it's really true yeah um, you need to be prepared you need to know what you're on about yeah you need to be able to answer any kind of question from a judge which can be terribly daunting when you first start out yeah of course as yeah. a lawyer um, right to the other end of you know cross examining witnesses you know I've cross examined people for an entire day or two before yeah. um, and getting into incredible detail about about their lives really you know fundamentally and and the real skill I think in a in a family lawyer is to be able to do that in a way that doesn't destroy a person yeah um, you know we see on the TV these you know these lawyers standing up attacking people and sort of knocking them down and what have you which um, I don't know that that may hold sway in other areas of the law, but certainly in family law, we're always conscious that once we're finished, people still have to continue in relationship with each other. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So being able to do that work respectfully and um, compassionately, yes. actually, yeah. is, is incredibly important. Yeah, and and when you are, you know, when you know, when you know you're going into something that is extremely, or oh, it, it, I presume it's going to be quite emotionally draining or it's really going to challenge some of your core beliefs. Is, is there anything you do you know, to protect yourself in that instance? Do you take on a bit of a different mm. persona and it's, you know, this is my day job. How do you sort of mitigate some of those really um, emotionally draining moments or times um, when you know it's people's lives and is it, do you find it hard to, do the boundaries blur between kind of your professional duties and your personal um, kind of values? How do you cope with all of that? I'd imagine it's quite a stressful, or can be quite a stressful. Yeah, it can be. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm a person of faith, so um, I, th I think for me, um, prayer and time, um, time alone is important. Um, conscious that's not everybody's cup of tea but that's certainly mine um having good professional and personal you know networks um is important so um knowing that you've got people who you can go to for advice but also to offload on yes. so it, it, it's really important that we um that we practice in groups so barristers practices right. as groups of people in chambers normally yeah. um I'm firmly against people practicing on their own, and I'm very vocal about that. I just don't think it's particularly safe. I mean, I have supervision clinic. I, as a as a nurse, ex nurse, um, I have had what we call clinical supervision, where you meet with a supervisor and talk about difficult things. Um, I brought that into my legal practice, right. and I see a psychotherapist every month <coughs> to talk about tricky tricky issues and yeah. and get supervision around that um it's something lawyers are really bad at we're really bad at self-care right um and but but generally we're pretty good at looking after each other so fellow professionals are pretty good at um at reaching out as the americans would say i guess yeah. um and and watching each other mm. uh, because some of this work can be incredibly stressful and, yes. and you know, people, um, we call it transference, you know, people put a lot of their stuff onto you, yes. um, whether, whether you invite it or not. <laughs> um, but there is, I think, on top of all of that, there is a huge degree of um, having to, um, you know, coining the phrase, not taking your work home with you. Yes. 
Um, I mean, I work in Monaco. I'm, I'm, I'm moving to the shore, but at the, for a long time I've worked in Monaco um, and lived on the North Shore. And in fact, I've really valued that sort of 30, 40 minutes, sometimes three hours yeah, drive home <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just to be able to kind of uh, consolidate really yeah. what happened during a day. Yeah. Um, because sometimes, in, in fact, sometimes what you can experience in a day can be beyond stressful. It can be actually quite traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, again, it's, it's a great point. We talk about this with our boys sometimes that it, to ask for help is it's not a weakness. Uh, and we, it, it's great to know that someone in your position still reaches out to mentors and yes. supervision sessions and, because I think it is, it is a difficult thing for some teenage boys sometimes to put their hand up and say, hey, I'm, I'm vulnerable here, or this is, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm worried about something. It kind of, yeah. we, I think we cope with it quite well here, but we, it's certainly been a cultural shift probably for teenagers across the world, you know, that now you don't have to be the, the man and just take yeah. everything on your, on your shoulders. So that's it's yeah. stellar advice, I think, from... Yeah someone to say hey even at your level you need it and yes the teenage boys with a lot less experience than you sort of need it as well I suppose um, I think we all need somebody I mean I, I I look back on my childhood and um and you know I, I came from a fairly rough place and you know had a fairly rough um upbringing you know so you know I'm, I don't want to go into too many details oh, but, no, know, yeah. my the family that I grew up in wasn't a far stretch from some of the families I'm dealing with right. okay. so I've, I've got sort of first-hand experience of that which might explain to some degree my interest in this yeah, of course, yeah. um, but um, but I can I can point to people um, of my childhood um, who took an interest and who I was able to talk to yes um, and you know those people are absolutely invaluable and what I would say to people is people actually love to be asked mm. people love to be asked for advice or or help you know so if there are people out you know in your community there who are thinking oh I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go and ask Mr. Such and Such yeah. or I'm not gonna go and ask uncle or whatever um, because they they'll not want to hear mm. that's generally not the case yeah. you know i mean yeah. people ask me for advice a lot yes. um, yeah. younger practitioners and things like that and and i like that i like to be able to to give people a, a helping hand yeah and make myself available for um for advice or help or anything you know yeah. people generally like to be asked yeah yeah no very i would very much so agree and there is a you know there's so many people that, that hopefully the boys feel they can go to so that's Hmm. Again, really good advice. And um, one thing um, I'd like to just pick back up on, you mentioned a lot about planning and preparation is hmm. central to what you do. And it's probably yeah. one of the most important things. It probably feels for our boys, they're always planning for something. They're always preparing yeah. for an exam yeah. or a trial or a sports club. Or yeah. We seem to be in this constant sort yeah. of stage of planning for something. Is there yeah. any hit... Um, tips or hints you would give someone who needs to plan better or prepare better what are some of the things you do to get that mm. at the best level it can be well first of all i mean get used to it because that's you know that's life yeah forever. absolutely is, you have to prepare. um I, and i think i think um you have to find what works for you you've got to get your system you yeah. know I mean, I, people laugh about me because I'm extremely organized. I have to be. I've got so many cases. I've got so many. I represent about 250 kids at any one go. So right, well. I've, got to, you know, I've got to be organized. Um, my PA has got to be organized. Mm. She's got to, <clears throat> you know, there's a procedure for how she manages my diary. There's a procedure for how she communicates with parents. You know, there's, yes. there's procedures for everything. Um, and I have a set way of doing most things. Yeah. Um, I have a set way of taking notes when I'm in the middle of, when I'm in a trial. Mm. Um, I have a set way of preparing cross-examination. Um, and it all, it, it, there's a, it, it's a system. There's yeah. a system for everything. Um, now, I might be bordering on the clinical level of planning. Yeah. Um, but 
um, I'm able to get through an awful lot of work and consequently make more money if that helps yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. as, as a consequence of, yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I, look, I work with a lot of barristers who are incredibly busy and they say they're not making any money. Right. Um, and it's because they're not organized. Yeah. You know, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's about, you know, um, realizing that every part of your job, every part of your job um, and every part of school, um, it's, it's the same deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got, your, you've got your exams, you've got your revision, um, you've got your sports, you've got, you know, the sectors yeah. of your job, yeah. if you like, yeah. as a student. Um, and, and you just have to work out your system, I think, around all of those things. Now, I wish when I was at school, I, you know, I got that. Yeah. You know, that, that it, it doesn't just happen. Nothing just happens. Yeah. You've got to plan it. You've got to, you've got to have a system around, around everything, what, whatever your task. Yeah. Um, and I, I could take you to every um, aspect of my role and tell you what the system is around right. that. Yeah. When I get an appointment from the court to act for children, um, I send the email to my PA. She extracts all of the files. She sends letters to the police to get information, or I'm Tamariki to get information. Yeah. Um, and then she sends me an email saying the file is ready to view. Yeah. You know, so I don't do anything yeah. off the top of my head. And, and I would imagine, Ian, for you, there's, there's a lot of comfort in that process that you don't it, have to rely on you know right. i'm not demeaning this but you don't have to rely on intelligence because there's a no. there's a that's process right. and you don't have to rely on that's right hoping something will happen so it's, it's that's really great advice um yeah. that's right probably. i wouldn't be able to sleep at night if i relied on yeah. that yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and that's when people make mistakes as well when they're under pressure and the process can't support them so that's right. That's, that's right. really um, insightful for us as a school to get that level of detail. And um, I want to thank you for the, for the time that you've given us. Um, hopefully, when we're back to normal, um, yes. maybe you know you can come and speak to some of our boys and parents that's and nice. staff and and give us even more of an insight. Really. So yeah. Thanks again, Ian. I know your time is um, extremely precious at the moment with you know 250 kids at a time that need you. Um, yes. So on behalf of everyone at Westlake, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us and um, we wish you well and hopefully we can do something together in the future to, to help all of our boys. Sure enough. So thank you very much. I really, right. really, really appreciate it. Great. Thank, thank you. you.